This is such a fascinating diagram. Some may say this is called the circle of life. And what it is, basically, it says life starts here and then evolved in many directions. So we see lots of bacteria. This is a chart mostly of bacteria. But if you zoom in to this section here, there we are, Homo sapiens as humans. So this chart lets you sort of see how life evolved over many different species. So there we are, humans right next to uh, Mus musculus, uh, the mice, Gallus gallus, the chickens. And then of course we're gonna see plants and lots of bacteria around here. But it makes me think every time I see this chart, even though humans are the dominant species, really, we're just one small piece of the puzzle or the wheel of life. Something to think about. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we classify organisms into charts like this and how we relate those organisms to one another. Let's get started. So when we talk about grouping organisms, we use the word phylogeny a lot. And phylogeny is just the evolutionary history of a species. So when we're talking about a phylogenetic tree or the phylogeny of an organism, we're talking about what, what is their evolutionary history? How do we determine the evolutionary history of an organism? Well, of course, we can look at fossils. We can look at their morphological homologies. Now, that's a big word. What it means is morphology, you think of the shape, the structure, homology, the similarities and structure. So we look at, the, we look at the organisms. Do they have some similar shapes, some similar structures? If they're similar, they're probably more closely related. And then today, we pretty much use molecular homologies to really show us how to make these trees. And when we say molecular homologies, we're looking at the DNA, we're looking at the proteins to see how similar or how, how much the same it is to each other. And then we can group organisms based on how similar their DNA is. Obviously, if we have an organism that is 99% similar DNA as another organism, oh, well, they're probably pretty similar. They probably evolved more closely related. And here's a typical phylogenetic tree that you see down here, right? If you think about the beginning, life evolved, it went in a few different directions, right, to bacteria, to archaea we talked about, and then of course us as animals, humans, in the eukarya domain, um, along with everything else. So this is just a very oversimplified tree that shows that. Um, and I mentioned these homologies, so I wanted to just give you a definition of those. Homologies are similarities due to a shared ancestry. So you may remember the forearm of the cat, the human, the whale. All of these share very similar arms. We call those homologies, right? You look at the, the humors, the radius, the ulna, the carpals. They're similar, they're homologies, basically meaning it's the same uh, structure because it's from a common ancestor. Systematics then is the systematic way of classifying organisms. We need to classify organisms to help us determine their evolutionary relationship. And we use a system called binomial nomenclature. Lots of big words here, but what we're meaning is binome, two names, two names to name all of our species. And we use the genus and the species. So if you forgot what those are, let me just remind you, using my dog Grace there, Gracie is technically, her genus and species, Canis lupus. Well, what does that mean? Where does that fall in the whole systematics? Well, remember we always start life has domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And the device I use is Dear King Paul Cried Out for Good Soup. Maybe that's a way you can remember it. Dear King Paul Cried Out for Good Soup. Um, so domain, dear king, Paul, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. These two the, are, make up what we call the binomial nomenclature. So we always use the genus and species to classify an organism. So Grace, her genus is Canis, her species is lupus, so her name, her scientific name is Canis lupus. For humans, our genus is Homo, our species is Sapiens, so of course we are Homo sapiens. This is how we classify organisms. 
So making sense out of it all, um, if you watch one of my very early presentations or videos on um, sort of how we classify life, I talked about this, but I want to go over it one more time just to remind you. So if we're going with our system, domain, Gracie is in domain eukarya, right? That includes the plants, the mushroom, all the animals. Kingdom animalia, she's an animal. Phylum chordata, right? She has a hollow dorsal nerve cord. Also a mammal, gives live birth, has lots of hair. Carnivore, meat eater. Family, and starting to see in the canines, right? We're really narrowing it down as we get up. But we, when we get to the top, genus and species, remember, canis lupus, is the binomial nomenclature for a dog. Canis lupus for the dogs, homo sapiens for the humans, okay? So that's just a reminder of how that system works. And if you wanted to learn it, you can just, you know, dear King Paul cried out for good soup and then just remember the order of them. So then a phylogenetic tree is what biologists use to represent traits that are either derived or lost. In other words, they're, they're, they're made, they're derived, they're, um, they evolve, or to simultaneously we could lose traits, right? We don't have all the same traits we did. So I found this phylogenetic tree of some rodents, okay? So you got your typical, you got some beavers, you've got some mice here, porcupines. Rodentia in our list is actually the order. So remember, dear King Paul cried out for good soup. So O is order rodents that's their order and then you can see we break it down even further now the thing you should also know is that you know this is an easy simplified way to remember it but it's actually much more complicated when you start looking at these because there are sub orders in other words something below an order but it's not quite at a family there are super families things above families it's not quite an order so let me give you an example so in order rodentia Myomorpha is a suborder, right? It's less than order, but it's not quite all the way down to family yet. You might have something that's bigger than family, and we might call it a superfamily. But Depodoidea, I probably massacred that, is a family. And you can see if you go even further, then we've got the genus here for a mot, for a mouse, the genus is mus, and then if you looked at their species, it would be mus musculus. So the genus and the species, again, make up the name or the scientific name of the organism we're talking about. Okay, so this is a typical phylogenetic tree, right? You can see over time, you know, where different traits were, were um, derived or we lost different traits. This tree particularly focuses based on its classification. These are the order, these are the suborder, family, genus, etc. So let me give you another example. So one way to show phylogeny, right, or the evolutionary history, is to use these trees that we see here. And so this is what we might call a primate phylogeny. Remember, humans share a common ancestor with chimpanzees, right, one of the great apes. We didn't evolve from modern day chimpanzees, but we share an ancestor, right? The same ancestor that the gorillas shared as well. If you go back further, a little further, we also have an ancestor with gibbons, the lesser apes. If you go really far back, right, we share a common ancestor with lemurs. Now, lemurs don't look anything like us, right? But they did their own evolving just like we did our own evolving as well. Now, another way to short, sort of show this is with a different looking little tree like this, right? This kind of shows the primate phylogeny. Here's a different way of showing that, right? If you look here, orangutans, gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees, humans, oh, there I am. Notice that we're similar. We share a common ancestor. So human, herder, shares an ancestor with the bonobo there. There's our common ancestor. But notice this, a bonobo and a chimpanzee share a more recent common ancestor than a human. So a bonobo and a chimpanzee are more closely related than a bonobo and a human. Now, if you go back farther and further, right? Yes, I do share an ancestor with a gorilla, but 
I'm more closely related here, as you can see, to the bonobo and chimpanzee. And the way we can figure that out is, as I mentioned earlier, we can look at structures, morphologies, but we can also, and how we do it most often, is look at the molecules, look at our DNA. How similar is our DNA and our proteins? Okay, so cladistics is another fancy term of grouping organisms into a clade. Okay, so what's a clade? A clade is a monophyletic group of species. Okay, what's monophyletic then? Well, monophyletic just means an ancestor species and all of its descendants. Okay, that's a lot of words. Let me just show you what I mean, right? So if here is an ancestor species and these are all of my descendants, that's a monophyletic clade. Same thing here. If this is an ancestor species, and these are all the descendants, that's a monophyletic clade. So let me show you a few ways we might see that. This highlighted region right here is a clade. It's a monophyletic group. Here is the ancestor species and all of its descendants. Come over here. This highlighted region, here's the ancestor species, or here, and all of its descendants there. That's a clade or a monophyletic group. But look at this green. Here's the ancestor species that's included, but notice here, those are left off of the green shaded area. So this green area here is technically not a clade. This is what we would call a paraphyletic group. It's got some of the descendants, but notice it doesn't include all. So the green is not a clade because it does not include all of the descendants, okay? All right, so, Trees, these trees actually show us basically a graphic of evolution. They show how speciation occurred because the relatedness of any two groups on the tree is shown by how recent their common ancestor is. So take for example this group, a lancet, a lamprey, a tuna, salamander, turtle, leopard. Okay. If the question was which share, which on, which organisms share the most recent common ancestor? Well, you'd go to the ones that are closest together and that have the least distance this way. So for example, turtle and leopard, their recent common ancestor is here. Now, a leopard and a salamander are related, but their common ancestor was way back here. So the question, if you had a question that said, what's the, which two share the most recent common ancestor? It would be turtle and leopard because these two, their ancestors here, salamander and leopard, their ancestor is way back here. So we construct these again based on DNA, protein similarity, as well as their shape, their structure, their morphology. Okay, how do you read a tree? I've been looking at several, I've been showing you a few, but let me give you a few terms. So if we have a tree here, remember our common ancestor for all of these is way back here. Then if a certain trait derived, let's say hair in a mammal, we could put a little mark and just write hair. Or if a, if a trait derived here and it was amniotic egg, we could put that trait there. So a derived trait, we would just mark on the line. It's not at the end, but it could be a little mark. Notice this group is the least related to the rest of these. We call this the out group, all right? So sure, this shares a common ancestor with all of these, but look how far away it was, right? So once the branch occurs, the one that comes way out here and is not really related to the others is called the out group. Now the two, Two that are often very similarly related, we call a sister species. So this species and that spe species are sister species. That species and that species are sister species as well. Okay? So just to review this again, because this is an important way to read a, read a tree. We've got our common ancestor at the end, right? This is the common ancestor for all. This would be the common ancestor for those, okay? A derived trait, we would just mark here and, and label what the trait is. Two that are really similar and then don't derive again, we see the sister species. And the ones that comes way out here in the first from the original ancestor would be the out group. So let's look at a tree and try to 
see if we can determine what the outgroup is, what the sister species and the common ancestor is. We first have to construct that tree because you aren't always going to have a tree made. Perhaps you have to construct it. Well, how would we do it? Well, there's a few ways. You can look at the DNA, but you can also look at some shared characteristics or some homologies. So right here I have a, a table. And here's the organisms up at the top, lancelet, lamprey, tuna, salamander, turtle, leopard. And in this chart, it tells you these traits, if it has it or not. So for example, a lancelet doesn't have vertebrae, but notice a lamprey, tuna, salamander, turtle, they all have a vertebrae. And you can see as it goes on that a leopard has all the traits, lancelet has none. So as these traits evolve, the leopard seems to be the, the one that has more than anything else. So how would we put this in a tree? Okay, so I've got an example here for you. What you do is the, you realize, okay, the lancelet, because it doesn't have any of these traits, it's obviously the out group. So it comes out here, that is the out group up here, the lancelet. Then what evolved next? Okay, if I'm looking, probably it looks like the vertebrae evolved next because all of these have it and some of these don't have those other ones, right? Like a lamprey doesn't have jaws. So vertebrae probably evolves before jaws. So notice that we put a little mark there and say vertebrae evolved there. Well, then the next to evolve must have been jaws because the tuna, salamander, turtle, and leopard have it, but the lamprey doesn't. So we put jaws there. Tuna goes here. Now, notice, tuna has jaws and a vertebrae, but Tuna doesn't have four limbs. Notice that four limbs, tuna, no, doesn't have it. So I can't put four limbs here. Four limbs has got to go after the tuna. Salamander, turtle, leopard, you can sort of see how this chart then fills out. Four limbs, amniotic air. Now, what do you get to when you have an animal like the leopard that has hair but nothing else does? Well, it's okay to write a little mark on the line to show hair was only in the leopard. Notice the rest of these didn't have Hair. Okay, which two are sister species? Think about it. Turtle and leopard, right? They're the cl most closely related in this particular phylogenetic tree. Okay, where's the common ancestor to everything? There, right? That would be the common ancestor to all of these. What if I asked you, what is the most com where's the most recent common ancestor for a tuna and a salamander? Okay, well, that is, an and that is an ancestor for the tuna and the salamander. That is an ancestor for the tuna and the salamander. But here, that is the most recent common ancestor for the tuna and salamander because notice it includes both. Okay? All right, so I mentioned these before, but I want to say it one more time. The in-group is the, the group, the taxa, whose phylogeny is being investigated. The out-group, so that's these. The out-group is the one that diverged before the lineage really started. So the out-group in this case is the lancelet. And you can see there, that's what a lancelet looks like. Then these others are technically in the in-group because we've started with a vertebrae, right? Vertebrae is really where we're starting on this chart. Everything after that is in the in group. Okay, and then of course a tuna, salamander, turtle, and leopard, they all have the vertebrae. So these would be considered the in group. That lancelet is the out group. Okay, so now to sort of finalize this, let's do a practice problem. So Here's the problem. Draw a phylogenetic tree based on the characteristics in the table below. Place hatch marks, or a little circle, on the tree to indicate the origin of each of the characters. Okay, so what I'm gonna let you do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to pause the video and I want you in your notes or on some, some paper somewhere to sketch this out. See if you can figure out how to do this and then um, I'm gonna draw it and help you. Okay, so put me on pause for a moment. Okay, did you figure that out? Um, honestly, to me, one of the hardest things is figuring out how to like draw this darn tree, like how to actually draw the structure. Well, here's a little hint that I figured out. If you start with some st stairs, 
it makes this a little easier. Okay, so start with some stairs, and then you can come up here. There's your out group. And then notice how this just kind of goes, like so. And then you count how many you have. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six things that need to go, and I've got one, two, three, four. So I need to come one more step down. Five, six. Okay, that's not super pretty, but you can get out your ruler if you want to. Okay, now we gotta figure out where these things go. Okay, so if I'm looking here, I notice the lancelet has none of the traits, right? So that's gonna be the out group. That's the one that comes up here. So I'm gonna write lancelet there. Okay, then this chart, it was pretty nice to me because it already organized them. Sometimes you're gonna have to figure out they're not gonna be in a nice order. But it's clear to see to me that then the trait that evolved next was vertebrae, right? So if I put a little hash mark or you put a little um, circle there and write vertebrae, okay, that goes there. That's when vertebrae evolved. Notice all of these things after that are gonna have vertebrae. So the fish, the frog, the bird, the rodent, and the gorilla. Now, four limbs evolved next, looks like, four limbs. Then it looks like the amniotic egg evolved there. Hair and fur evolved there. Oh, I got an issue with this dorsal fin. I'm gonna come back to that later. Okay, so let's now put the organisms in. Lancelet, and then it looks like the fish would be there because the fish has a vertebrae. Then it looks like the frog has four limbs, and the bird, the rodent, and then finally the gorilla. Now, I gave you kind of an easy chart because it's already in order. If they're not in order, or if you got like a one here and a zero, like you just have to sort of reason it out and put it in your own order. We're left with, so that looks good, right? Lancelet doesn't have anything. Everything after that in the in group has the vertebrae. But we're left with this like tricky one, dorsal fin. Fish has it, but none of the others. But notice how this is sort of like an odd man out. So what you can then do, if it's kind of a weird trait that's just in there, you can just add this directly on the line for the fish. So I can go to fish and say, oh, there's a dorsal fin, okay? It doesn't make sense necessarily in this character trait because we're obviously looking at sort of the development of a mammal, right, getting to this group here. But a dorsal fin is something that was included in the chart, and because fish had it, I can just add it in there separately. A dorsal fin evolved separately from the rest of these in the group, okay? So hopefully you were able to finish that practice problem. Um, and if you didn't, maybe practice some more. I'm sure you can search for some of these practice problems and try them on your own. The whole point of this video was about how we classify organisms based on their evolutionary relationships.